America presentation by Chuck Missler is entitled, Hosea, Can You See? For a complete audio and video teaching tape catalog, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177. At the Christian Bookseller Association, which is the, one, the big annual convention each year for, for the bookstores, I was uh, there, to, and Nan and I are both there, to introduce our new books, Nan's book, uh, Faith in the Night Seasons, which has done very, very well, changing lives all over the country already. And I was there, of course, to promote Cosmic Codes, our new hardback uh, book on uh, hermeneutics, in effect. But uh, at the big conference, when I started to present it, I stopped after the first two or three minutes and set it aside because the Lord gave me quite a different message that we just gave somewhat spontaneously at CBA, and that's the one that I feel burdened to give you this morning. That's why I rearranged the schedule a little bit in terms of what I was scheduled to speak on. Um, we've done recently a very, very in-depth study of the book of Hosea as part of our commentary series. As most of you know, we go through the Bible verse by verse. They, uh, th those tapes go to our weekly, tape a week subscribers, but they also get put in our eight tapes per volume leather-bound commentary series along with the extensive notes. And uh, we were going through Hosea, and I was startled to discover what I believe Hosea is saying to you and I here in America. And so I'm going to call this Hosea's Challenge to America. Uh, Hosea 4.1, incidentally, has a verse that has really uh, been the foundational verse for Nan's trilogy, the three books that she's done. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no love, nor truth, nor intimate knowledge of God. And those of you that are familiar with her trilogy, you know that her book, uh, The Way of Agape, is really about what is God's love. Most people don't understand what God's love is. They confuse it with human love. Her second book, Beyond, uh, I, excuse me, uh, Be uh, um, Transformed, is, of course, Knowing God's Truth. As you know, my name's on the books, but I did a trivial part of it. It's really her books. I put my name on there for marketing reasons, and, uh, and but I, uh, the books are really uh, things that the Lord has given her. Her latest book, Faith in the Night Seasons, is really understanding God's will, God's call to intimacy with him. And uh, so I encourage you to take a look at those. But it's interesting how Hosea pulls those together. But um, let's stand back a little bit and realize that yesterday we tried, in several ways, several of the speakers tried to highlight what we're facing as we go to the year 2000. There's the euphoria in many ways because it's a new millennium and there's new optimism in the air about many things, and yet there's some forebodings. And we, uh, as we look at our horizon, I hope it wasn't too disturbing, but at the same time I think we need to be open and objective and candid and not be kidding ourselves about what we're looking at as we roll into the next decade. And uh, we had a summary of the Middle East. Iraq, Iran, Syria, Egypt. We also are facing the declaration of the Palestinian state and all the world politics that are, and all the machinery that's going into this uh, confrontation that's brewing, possibly in the next few months, actually. And then we talked about the Magog invasion, Russia's ambitions in the Middle East. And we talked about China's ambitions, not just in the Pacific, but worldwide. We didn't touch on North and South Korea, but that's also another powder, powder keg ready to blow open. And, of course, we touched on the rise of the European superstate. We also had a very competent presentation by Tom Cloud about the whole global picture, global recession, debt implosion, those things. We haven't really focused on the predicament that we're facing here in this country, the anti-Christian mood that's increasing, the rise of fascism as we abandon the checks and balances of our Constitution, due process, and all these cornerstones of our freedoms of the last two centuries. And, of course, we talked a little bit about Y2K. The point I'm making, as we survey our horizon, there are many things that are major challenges brewing. Many people talk, when they talk about the new millennium, they talk about Y2K. The only distinctive about Y2K is that it's scheduled. <laughs> These other things have some ambiguities of timing. Well, as we study the book of Hosea, 
Hosea, of course, was a prophet or a seer, as some people put it. And he was called to present God's indictment against the northern kingdom. God had a controversy with him. And in many respects, portions of the book are almost like a legal case being presented before court of God's indictment against the northern kingdom. I think most of you realize that after Solomon's death, the nation split into two. The uh, southern kingdom under uh, uh, Rehoboam uh, stayed faithful to the temple services, and um, we see that called the house of Judah. The northern kingdom split off under Jeroboam and embraced idolatry. And so we have the, the, the split of the kingdoms, and uh, in the, well, we'll get into the whole history here a little bit. But um, let's take a look at what Hosea was facing as he was called to minister to the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom's standing army had recovered all the territory previously lost, all the way to Damascus. And they also enjoyed unparalleled prosperity. People had several homes. They had incredible trade. They were prospering uh, beyond uh, their uh, imagination. It was for them, in their minds, of course, it was the best of times. Everybody was affluent. Everybody was enjoying material blessings from the prosperity. And uh, it was indeed the best of times from their point of view. God's indictment against the northern kingdom that Hosea was burdened to carry to them is that they had exchanged their loyalty to their heritage for idol worship. God had nurtured them for two centuries by caring for them as a loving father, providing for their needs, seeing them through their difficulty. And they had responded by exchanging that loyalty for the worship of idols. What were the results of that? To give you a very short summary of what is extensively detailed in the book, is they had reached the lowest ebb of immorality, social injustice of all kinds, bribing judges and that sort of thing. Violent crime was rampant. Religious hypocrisy. Political rebellion. Selfish arrogance. Spiritual ingratitude. Just to give you a broad, quick summary list of the results of their rejecting the heritage of the worship of the true God. Now, the predicament is, in effect, very similar to that classic opening line of Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Tale of Two Cities. The first sentence is classic. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. That characterized the northern kingdom. It was the best of times. Prosperity. Everybody thought things were great. And yet it was the worst of times. They, where there was more immorality. Uh, uh, they had, they had uh, reached the lowest ebb of their history. Now Hosea is called to minister to them and uh, his, this, try to summarize his message. Says, Even though a loving God, a caring God, had taken care of them, and provided that abundance and prosperity. Their sin and their disloyalty and their abandonment of him forces God into a very, very tragic position because it, he, to vindicate his justice, it would force him to bring judgment. And Hosea's burden was to bring that message to them, to bring their case, his case against the northern kingdom, and to point out that as a result of their abandonment and their ingratitude for it, he pro they attributed their prosperity to these idols. And God was forced to vindicate his uh, justice by using their enemies as his instrument of judgment. And Hosea's message was, shortly, they would be history. And uh, I think, uh, obviously, those of you that know your Bibles know that in their thrusting about, the northern kingdom got into very unfortunate foreign alliances, which in turn, in fact, exacerbated the situation where uh, the Assyrians in 722 capture 
and destroy, eliminate the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom had some redeeming kings. They, they were also deteriorating. The northern kingdom went from bad to worse, if you go through the whole su succession of kings. The southern kingdom had a few that did better than some, but they also deteriorated. And about another century goes by before God has to use the Babylonians to be his instrument of judgment against the southern kingdom. But that was for an interval of 70 years. They do return, and they do continue. The Babylonians by then had conquered the Assyrians, so they were God's instrument in a parallel way to the, in, in, uh, as God used the Assyrians in the northern kingdom. Now, the question, of course, as you get into Hosea, and I'll, I'm sparing you this morning in a detailed summary of the book. I do encourage you to plunge into the book because it is one of the richest books in the Scripture. It, it is one of the books that most creatively exploits all kinds of similes and metaphors and other figures of speech. And uh, uh, by the way, something you should realize that God does use idioms, similes, metaphors. Uh, in our book, Cosmic Codes, we include appendix. Do you know how many different kinds of rhetorical devices? There are obviously metaphors, similes, allegories, so forth. Do you know how many different kinds of, of uh, devices are used in the scripture? Over 200. And uh, many of the most creative ones are in the book of Hosea. They're all, uh, they're all listed in our book and with uh, examples and references and so forth. But one of the things I wanted to focus on this morning is, is, is it possible that there's a parallel here? Now, let's take a look at America in the light of Hosea. Our stock indexes are at unprecedented highs. Everybody's feeling we're really prosperous. Detroit's excited because people are buying their third and fourth cars in many of the American families. Almost every home in America has a computer. And it's hard to find a pedestrian on the street without a cellular phone sticking out of his ear. Fuel for our cars costs less than the water we drink. Yeah, how much did you pay for those little bottles of water? You know, okay. And we could go on. And, and I, won't, I don't have to go through other examples, but you and I, as, as, as general Americans, men on the street, are enjoying what people regard as the best of times. We've never been more prosperous. The market's never been higher. People have never been uh, more comfortable in materialistic terms. And, uh, however, what's the result of all this? Let's take a look at our society. Homosexuality. Just an all alternative lifestyle. We murder babies that are socially inconvenient. We change marriage partners like a fashion statement. We've abandoned the sanctity of commitments in our marriages and in our business. I can remember several decades ago when I started my first company. Even back then, on Wall Street, the top tier, my word is my bond. We had over a million dollars deposited in our bank account. We had formed the Delaware Corporation. I had six guys quit their jobs and were getting into the software for a new computer venture. I had several large-scale computers being shipped to us from Maynard, Massachusetts to our proposed location in Ann Arbor without a scrap of paper being signed. This was all done over the phone and by handshakes of people who knew and trusted each other. That was the way things were done. Now, these weren't men that were necessarily moral. They could have been cheating on their wives or all, but they, but they knew that, that they had an ethic. My word is my bond. A commitment was a commitment. But today, tragically, that's all part of the past. In, as, as CEO of one of the first public companies, I had a, we celebrated a transaction with the CEO of another well-known publicly traded company. And within 30 days, he ignored it and said, so sue me. And I can remember I did a speech in uh, Silicon Valley on this issue. I said, going, I'd come from the auto industry in the into the semiconductor industry. I said, that going into, from any industry in the semiconductor industry is like going from a convent into a brothel. And the San Jose Mercury picked that up, and it was a <laughs> banner headline for a while. The ethics, the rough and tumble ethics in the secular world have deteriorated tragically, tragically. God rebuked Israel, the northern kingdom, for their brutality and for their murder and for warfare deriving from 
the abandonment of their heritage. Well, take a look at the United States. We go through a long list. I'll just mention a couple. Waco. Where the, now it's, there's a trial brewing in October, the essence of which is to demonstrate that the government had intentionally set out to murder those Americans in Waco. What a tragedy. But the great tragedy is from the pulpits of America. Where was the outrage? Most of us wouldn't agree with the theology of David Koresh, but that's no excuse to murder him and his followers without due process. And the, the, the surprising things you stand back, where was the outrage from the pulpits of America? Not hardly a peep. Then we have Columbine High School. Saw a wonderful cartoon in the paper. Said, Dear God, why did you allow what happened in Columbine in my high school? Signed, Susan, 12th grader. A little letter attached to it said, Susan, I'm not allowed at your high school. Signed, God. It was a cartoonist way of summarizing the reality that we face in this country. New York City has recorded more crimes in one year than England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Switzerland, Spain, Sweden, Netherlands, Norway, and Denmark combined. One city in America. As Helen Jenner was pointed out yesterday, there are more, mur more murders, more violent crimes in Washington, D.C., which has gun control laws, than any other city in America. And as far as warfare, we too have had our Vietnams and our Kosovo and so forth. We don't have to go into that. But what we should have been sending were Bibles, not bullets and bombs. We should have been sending missionaries, not missiles. In our whole culture in this country, we have carefully disconnected character from destiny. We, immorality and deceit have come to characterize the highest office of our land. It's getting to the point that even jokes aren't any funny anymore. They're too predictable. Our politics have condoned and covered up more murders than we dare even list. Our public enterprises have been prostituted for the convenience of the elite. Our entertainment celebrates adultery, fornication, violence, aberrant sexual practices, and every imaginable form of evil. We have become the primary exporters to the rest of the world of everything that God abhors. That's the real candid mirror that we have to look at so indeed, we may feel it's the best of times, but using God's yardstick, it is the worst of times. So one of the questions we have here in America, it's a question that I ask almost every day. I get asked every day. Is it too late? There are many that are observing the predicament of this country that would argue it's over. There are many pulpits that have really, in effect, shrugged off any possibility of a turnaround. And that's one of the questions, very practical questions, we need to look right in the eye. And as we do, then, of course, what derives from that, what can we do, you and I? What can we do about it? And is it too late? Well, when we consider these things, I'm very gratified to turn to another prophet, a prophet by the name of Jonah. I'm always amused in the scripture where one of the, comment, one of the uh, remarks is, you know, uh, can any prophet come out of Galilee? And that shows up in the scripture, but whoever said that there was obviously had not done his homework because there are two prophets that did come out of Galilee. A guy by the name of Jonah was one of them. It's interesting that both of those prophets, Old Testament prophets, were committed to minister to a, to a pagan capital. Now, you all know the story of Jonah. Um, Nineveh was the capital of the world, the pagan capital, obviously. It had ruled the world for several centuries. And you all know, of course, that Jonah... Oh, well, and, and then the Jonah was called to go minister there. Nineveh 
was scheduled for destruction. Nineveh was 40 days from what we would call ground zero. And, of course, the, the, the colorful story is that Jonah was called to go minister there. Now, it's understandable why he would resist that. They were the enemies of Israel. They had attacked Israel several times previous. And Jonah was called to minister there. And he was not excited about the assignment until God explained it to him a little more clearly. You know? And, of course, ultimately he does go there. And when he goes there, he doesn't have a user-friendly market research message to present to them. He walked through town saying, 40 days and you get yours. His behavior shows he did have an attitude problem. And yet he delivered the message, 40 days and you get yours, or 40 days and comes destruction. Nineveh was scheduled for judgment by God in 40 days away. And then we witness what I think is is the uh, greatest miracle in the Old Testament it has nothing to do about the great fish. It has to do with repentance from the king on down. Within those 40 days, there was repentance through the land. And Nineveh was spared for about another century. Later, Nahum was called to go minister. And it did not have the same result. Now, um, one of the things uh, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit is just let's just get clear in our minds what the predicament of the northern kingdom was. Material prosperity, but an abandon, abandonment of their heritage, which they had enjoyed for two centuries. And result, the lowest moral ebb of their history. Let's look at America. We enjoy a prosperity that's unparalleled of our, in our history. And yet we, too, have abandoned the heritage that has made this country possible, that we've enjoyed for a little over two centuries. Now, Hosea's burden was to communicate to the northern kingdom that God was going to judge them and he was going to use the, their enemies to judge them. I'm very uncomfortable with the message I believe Hosea is communicating to you and I today. Because as I struggle pulling together our various intelligence services to pull our newsletter together, Every day, there's more information that highlights, on the one hand, the atrophy and mismanagement and misdirection of our own resources, especially in the defense area. We don't even have a policy of retaliation. We've announced to our enemies that we plan to sustain a first strike. That's called an invitation. Our military prowess our te uh, is being cut back substantially and then deliberately dissipated on other errands throughout the world. And while this is going on, our enemies are on the one hand tooling up aggressively in preparation for nuclear war. Russia and China are busily preparing for a war that they believe is inevitable. And while they do that, we've maneuvered so skillfully as to almost force them into a coalition. Russia and China and the Muslims are forming affiliations, motivated by their hatred of this country. There's a confrontation coming. That's why, as I look at uh, the, the story of Jonah, I find great comfort in that, because that tells me that one of the part of the good news is that God is in the miracle business. Robert Bork, Justice Bork, has published a book called Slouching Towards Gomorrah. And he highlights the depth and the background of the whole decay and degeneration 
of this country, and his conclusion in the last several chapters of the book highlight the only thing he believes that will save America is a grassroots revival, a spiritual revival in this country. I could elaborate on all of these things, but you've heard speakers in the last couple of days illuminate all the different facets of this issue. Now, the good news is God is in the miracle business. And there is a challenge that uh, I want to give you that is from the Scripture. You know, many people are surprised to discover that God appeared to Solomon. And uh, when he did, he uh, uh, gave him, he announced to him a principle. He said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, I know there are purists that would say, now wait a minute, Chuck, that was something that God announced to Solomon that applies to Israel, and indeed it does. Denotatively, it certainly does. But I'm going to suggest something else. I'm going to suggest that our God is an immutable God. Our God changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's announcing here to Solomon a principle. And let's, let's re-examine this very closely. He says, if my people who are called by my name. How many of you in this room are God's people? Can I see a show of hands? Praise God. If my people who are called by my name. Now, this is where usually when I give a talk like this, I'll often get a little flippant and suggest that some of you are to be congratulated because you're the best undercover Christians the world's ever seen. Your family, the people at work, your neighbors never suspect that you're sold out to Jesus Christ. But I hope I'm being flippant when I say that. No, he says, if my people who are called by my name. How many of you are called by God's name in the community in which you dwell? Praise God for that. God says here in Second Chronicles 7.14, he says, if my people who are called by my name will do four things, I'll do three things. What are the four things that God would have of you and I? Well, the first is to humble ourselves. I think we know how to do that. We may not do that enough. We may stumble from time to time. But there's no great mystery about how to humble ourselves before the throne of God. Second thing, he says, and pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and pray. We know how to pray. We don't do it as often as we should. We may not do it as intensely as we should. There's obviously it, we can deal with that, but we know how to do that. The third thing is not quite so simple. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. That's not an intellectual thing. That's a commitment kind of thing. That's, that's the kind of endeavor that you engaged in when you were courting your spouse. It's a desire. It's a passion. It's a, it's a commitment kind of thing. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. Ah, yes, there's one more thing. And turn from their wicked ways. Ouch. You see, what this tells me is that Bill and Hillary Clinton are not our problem. This is not addressed, in my opinion, to the executive branch, to the Senate, to the Congress. This is addressed to the body of Christ. I think that Bill and Hillary Clinton and all the rest of it are symptoms. See, the problem is if you go, go through the country and ask somebody, What's the biggest problem in America? Is it ignorance or apathy? And they'll say, I don't know and I don't care. The amazing thing is that only one person in four put our present administration in office because the Christians didn't get off their dust and vote. You see, <laughs> 
I think you can make a scriptural case, that, and I think you can get also a pragmatic case from, from observation, that we get the administrations we deserve. And when we have pulpits in America who take the position that our citizenship is in heaven and therefore we're relieved of other stewardship diligence, I think that's tragic. I'm indebted to Pat Matriciana's little pamphlet, Dual Citizenship, where he eloquently argues from Scripture how you and I, in this country especially, are burdened with a dual responsibility. Yes, we're citizenship in heaven. That takes priority over everything. And yet, we also are to be diligent stewards. I, be I believe you and I are going to be called accountable before the throne of God for our stewardship of the mandate that we've enjoyed for the last two centuries. Most people inherit a government that evolved through history. We inherited a government that was prayerfully designed by geniuses based on biblical principles. And that has served us well for the better part of the last two centuries. And we've shrugged it off, taken it for granted, we allow it to be trampled without a peep from our pul pulpits, from our homes, and from our, from our uh, ballot boxes. We're not, we don't hold our elected people accountable. The problems in this country are ours. And what this verse tells me is before God, the problem is sins, not in the country in general, in the body of Christ. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek by faith and turn from their wicked ways, And will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land? If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Apparently not until then, in a corporate sense. And I will forgive their sin. Praise God. You and I individually, and I also believe corporately, can take advantage of the Christian's bar of soap. Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We celebrate his faithfulness in our then will I forgive? Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, <coughs> and will heal their land. I think that's what it's all about. I think we come together here as a conference, as Christians, as conservatives, and certainly in general, the Christians in particular, to learn what we can of the Word of God, to try to gain some insights as to what he would have of each of us in the days ahead. But we also come collectively here, it's called stealing the mind of America. Not stealing the mind of southern Utah or upstate New York or some other region, it's stealing the mind of America. And what's embraced in, in the concept of this conference is this treasure that we have handed over to the pagan left and then grumble about the results. I think we're facing major challenges. I personally have the view that America is on the skids to fascism and the pace is accelerating. And I think the, the uh, potential disruptions on our horizon are going to be seized by our adversaries as excuses to increase the pace towards a fascist state. There are people in Washington that suggest the possibility we won't even have elections in the year 2000. You say, well, that's some extremist. No, I won't. Well, Don Hodel, former Secretary of Energy, has published articles suggesting the rationalization for just that kind of an action. Now, that's probably extreme, but I think it does. It's useful, if nothing else, because to, to get us to realize that we do have people with a variety of motives that are embracing the kind of future that you and I would abhor. No. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. 
And I personally hold the view that this principle is something that you and I can claim and embrace on behalf of our children. I'd like to uh, give you an example. You may say this is a rather bizarre. I want to talk to you now about a little bird. John Eckerberg talked about parakeets. Of course, he contrived that story just for the, for the moment. But I want to talk to you about the golden plover. The golden plover is a little tiny bird that flies from Alaska to Hawaii each year. And um, it starts in, uh, in uh, Alaska, and it flies for 88 hours. See, there are no islands between Alaska and Hawaii, and it can't swim. So it has to leave Hawaii. And uh, the other part of the problem is the bird can, it weighs about 130 grams. Under, under 130 grams, it, it, it's no longer viable. That's the minimum weight. And so in order to have the energy to make the flight, the golden plover picks up 70 grams of fat in anticipation of the journey. And uh, it is going to fly. It's going to make 250,000 wing flaps. Or it's a million. Anyway, I forgot the notes. Anyway, it's... They've analyzed this bird to some extent. I'm indebted to the Germans, uh, Dr. Werner Gitt and uh, his associates, who have gone through all the trouble to pull this together. It turns out the equations for the fuel consumption from the fat, if he leaves Alaska and he takes advantage of these of the 70 grams of fat that he's picked up, he can only fly for about 72 hours. And so what's the result is that he would enjoy a fatal crash into the sea after only 72 hours because the amount of fuel consumption isn't enough to get there. Yet he does get there. He actually will fly um, for 88 hours to make Hawaii. In fact, the way he does this is he flies in formation. You ever wonder why birds fly in these deformations? Is because the birds are drafting. If you're a race driver, I don't know if you... I don't know how many of you have an IMSA license or have taken a Grand Prix driving course. My son and I did that a few years ago. One of the first things you learn, uh, well, a number of things you learn, but one of them is drafting. You try to get in the, the, uh, the wake, so to speak, of the uh, car ahead of you. Well, the birds, by flying behind another bird, use about 20% less energy. And so they fly in V formations, and they trade off the lead position. You know this? Well, the golden plover flies in formation, so it ends up, after 88 hours, with actually a 6.8 gram reserve for headwinds. Now there still are there are all kinds of mysteries about migration. They have no idea how they navigate. They have done more experiments on the presumptions of winds or uh, uh, ma magnetism, and they, it's still a mystery. We have, especially when they're going across open sea with no landmarks, and yet they do. And obviously, just a slight deviation from course would put them way off course, and yet they somehow do this, and that's one of the interesting mysteries left to, to unravel, but the point is, uh, I was sharing this, I was fascinated with this whole thing for, for a lot of reasons, partly just to understand this incredible creation. Romans 1 does hold us accountable to really understand the creation and to glorify God from what we discover. I was sharing this with Nan over breakfast one morning. That gives you some idea what she has to put up with at breakfast one morning. And she said, you know, that's really neat. That's just like us, isn't it? You see, we can't make it alone. If the golden plover loaded up with all the fat it could carry, it wouldn't make the course. And the reason it does is because it, is, it forsakes not the assembling of the other golden plovers. And I'm going to suggest to you and I that you and I here today are um, faced with the same problem. You see, you and I are facing not just our families and our, media, our personal uh, issues, our family issues, our community issues, but our national issues. Now, I think all of us recognize that without God, we can't make it. And without us, he won't. He won't do it. And so one of the things, let's leave the slides, the heck with all that stuff. Um, one of the things that you and I are facing is we try to uh, integrate all the messages that we've had here in the last two days. Is what does it mean for each of us? Well, it means a lot of things. One of the things it means, and can we get the lights up a little bit? It's hard to 
can I get, get someone to bring a light so I can't, uh, it's hard to talk when I can't see you. I'm talking to a blackness here. And, uh, okay. I really believe that you and I are facing the most challenging horizon that, is, that we've ever faced in our lifetime, spiritually and in every other way, but spiritually is a critical one. And as we leave here and go back to our homes and our churches and our community Bible studies and whatever, we're going to be facing some very, very real issues at every level of concern. And those issues, I think, will need to be folded against a perspective. And we hope that this conference has facilitated in the development of your perspectives. Are we still having trouble with the lights? There's a technological problem here. Everything else going, Bill, you're doing a great job on everything else, but we'd love to have some lights in here. There we go. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry, it's hard to talk when you can't see you people. Um, a few years ago, I learned something from John Ankerberg that I would like to um, try today. Some of you here in this audience, I hope, have been challenged by one or several of the speakers over the last two days. Some of you in this audience, well, first of all, most of you, I hope, several times, through several, by several speakers, have been challenged into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'm going to indulge in the luxury of assuming that that issue is, for this purpose at least, resolved. I think I'm assuming most of you have come here even, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and are anxious to know what he would have of you in the next few days. Uh, next, next few days, next few weeks, next few months, whatever. I want to... Uh, lay out the possibility that God may have called you to take on a special project. I'm not necessarily talking about a change of career, but I have in mind something that's more than a few months, say at least a year long. Let's just include in our horizon, conceptual horizon, the coming, say, uh, 16, 18 months, two years, whatever. If you've been challenged enough that you personally are available for a special project, and by the way, I'm not talking about a project assigned by Chuck Missler or any of the other speakers, but a project assigned to you by the Holy Spirit. This project might be personal. It might be family. It might be community. It might be larger in scope. But if you've been challenged during this conference, God has nudged you to take on a special project for him. I'd like you to stand. Praise God. Praise God. Now... Praise God. What I'd like you to ask you to do right now is to bow your heads and go before the throne of God in your own words, in your, in your, in, in your own heart, and declare before the throne of God your availability for that special assignment. And ask Him, ask the Holy Spirit to clarify it for you, and when you believe you know specifically what that project is. And go ahead and sit down. Just go ahead and pray and ask God to let you know what that praise God. When you believe you know what it is, what God would have you undertake. Go ahead and sit down.
Now, while the rest of these people are finishing up, why don't the rest of us stand and pray for them? Let's all just stand. And I might suggest that any of you that have undertaken a special commitment, if you feel like it, drop me a note. Our ministry has done a terrible job. Man does a good job, but the rest has done a terrible job at responding to correspondence. We're trying to fix that. But I would love to hear from you as to what you're doing so that we can pray for you at the ministry. But let's all bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you that you're a God that delights in keeping and making it and keeping your promises. And we thank you, Father, that we can take advantage of the extremes that you've gone to that we might live. And further, that you've brought us all here right now to this point in time by your divine appointment. And we thank you, Father, for the conference. We thank you, Father, for the messages that you've provided. But above all, Father, we thank you for the insights that you have given us. And Father, we all preach for discernment among the opportunities in front of us. And we pray, Father, for resolve in our commitments. And we bring before your throne especially those that have declared themselves here in public in the last several days, in the last several ways. And we also bring before you these people that have stood this day declaring their availability for a special assignment from you. And Father, we would ask through your Holy Spirit and through your word that you would continue to clarify and specify what you would have of each of us in the days ahead. We come before your throne, Father, acknowledging our sin, acknowledging our ingratitude, acknowledging our lack of diligence in our stewardship of the heritage that we have so uniquely enjoyed that has come to us at such a high price. And Father, we also confess our presumptions, our selfishness. We pray, Father, that you would just cleanse us from that sin. We pray, Father, that you would indeed illuminate that path before us. We pray, Father, you would help each of us in this room grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might be more fruitful stewards, and more pleasing in thy sight, as we commit ourselves this day into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like information about purchasing this presentation on videotape, or for a tape catalog of all of the Stealing the Mind of America audio or videotapes, or for future conference information, Call Compass at 1-800-977-2177. Or you can write to Compass at 460 Canfield Avenue, Suite 1000, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 83815.